Uh, I'm now going to invite Ian Chalmers, Technical Director of Alkane, to tell us about their Boda Forfi discovery in New South Wales. Ian, over to you. Okay, thanks. I'm just getting myself organised. Um, now that's gone. Good. I'll share screen if you bear with me for a moment. Okay, so look, thanks very much for the team for putting this on. It's uh, been pretty interesting so far. So I'm going to give you an overview of what we're doing at the Boda project. But quickly, first of all, Alkane. Uh, Alkane's an Australian listed company. It's been around for 50 years. Um, and I can honestly say that I wasn't there from day one, contrary to you know, popular opinion. Um, but really we have in the last um, probably 20 to 30 years, very much focused on gold. So I feel a bit of an imposter here to, uh, to talk about copper. And most of the work we've done has been in the central west of New South Wales, which I'll show you in a moment. The other important thing is that we did start out with a multi-commodity approach. So we were looking for other metals as well as the gold. And that led to the discovery and evaluation of a very large rare metal, uh, rare earth resource, which we've just recently demerged out of Alkane. And that company is doing incredibly well. It's currently got a market capitalization of about $400 million. So it's a, it's a rare earth company with a great future. So going into the region, the central west region, you can see on the map where it is relative to Sydney, it's about 400 kilometres to the northwest of Sydney in a very large uh, agricultural region, but also well known for a, some, a number of large mines, which I'll show you in a moment. Alkine, as I said, has been active for 30 years and really we came in initially looking for effectively origenic gold deposits. The top gold deposits we were very familiar with working in the, in the eastern gold fields region of Western Australia. Uh, we found one of those deposits, a little place called Tamingley, and that was in 2001. Drilled it out, eventually put it into production in 2014, and it currently just um, made some another large discoveries nearby. Um, that'll add to that, so it looks like it'll have another 10 year life uh, at Tamingley and, and generating very substantial cash flows uh, for us. In doing that regional study, we noticed a mine called Mitchell's Creek was over to the, to the east of us, uh, which it was a 200,000 ounce historic producer. Um, and we started to look at that, but in doing that, or when we were doing that, we realized it was owned by Rio Tinto, which we ultimately acquired off quite the tenement off them in 1998. But we also started to recognize the potential for large porphyry copper gold systems. And that was based on the knowledge that was coming out at that time about the discoveries at Cady and Ridgeway, what was going on at North Parks and at Cal. So we could see the potential for bigger targets other than what we were doing at, uh, at Tumingley. So let's zero in a bit on the geology and I, here I must pay um, recognition to CODES and CODES is the Centre for Ore Deposit and Exploration Science that comes out of the University of Tasmania. A whole raft of uh, very, very good people uh, developed an enormous knowledge about the porphyry copper systems, porphyry copper gold systems uh, in what we now call the Macquarie Arc in New South Wales. And they combined with the Geological Survey of New South Wales and industry. A number of companies like ourselves uh, participated in the study. It was about a four year study. And the key thing about that, and you can probably see the little, little corner, little red rectangle down here. So that's the Macquarie Arc within the Lachlan Origin, or Lachlan Fold Belt, as a lot of, a lot of people uh, call it. What they, what they showed was it was a very clear evolution to the Macquarie Arc. Uh, the calc alkaline to alkaline, alkalic affinity of the, of the rocks, the volcanic rocks and the intrusive rocks. It's about a 50 million year life um, and it had classic island arc type environments and deep marine environments, which made it very prospective for large scale porphyry gold copper systems. That we used that information that we got from that working with um, with codes and the New South Wales Geological Survey to take that back to what we were seeing in the Boda area and regionally throughout the central west of New South Wales. And the little, the image on the left is a, is a magnetic, an air, airborne magnetic image, and I'll, you'll understand a bit more about that in a moment. But I put on some of the other more well-known deposits. And it said, there's our Tomingley project there, which I said is not porphyry, it's an orogenic thing, at about two million ounces. North Park's probably one of the better known gold copper systems there. The giant Katy deposit in the sort of the south part of the section there, very large, both gold and, and uh, copper deposit. And then Cal, which is more of a gold deposit off to the west. And McPhillamy's, which I'll also take, uh, take the credit for finding. We, uh, we discovered that in joint venture with Newmont. 
Uh, about 2.3 million ounces at that stage. Uh, Newmont had earned 51%. We had 49 and they decided to sell it. Effectively, the sale of McPhillamy has generated enough cash return for us to fund commonly without uh, having to go to the debt market. The other thing to notice on that map is the, the slightly different colours. And the most important one is this sort of pinky colour through here. That pinky, oops. Whoop, we, what happened there? We, we, we crashed badly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just bear with me. Okay, back to that. That pinky colour is what are called the phase four volcanics and intrusives in this arc development. And those are the rocks that ultimately were demonstrated to be very clearly the most prospective in the whole region. So moving to, to focus in a little bit, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the Macquarie Arc Porphyry model. And this is, this is something that Newcrest have generated. They've been very, very free with their information in the last four or five years and what they've published. And you can see that classic model that, that, that Greg was showing you earlier, the, the red monzonite. In this case, they're monzonites. They're not granite uh, type rocks. They're monzonitic rocks. They're alkalic rocks. Um, generating a large sort of potassic halo, potassic core around it, going up into the propylitic zone. And the little things you can see here are basically where the metal assemblage is, gold, gold, copper in that area down there, and then the trace elements in the outer, outer halo. And that's probably better summarised from this diagram, which codes have generated, which you can see the way the metal assemblage is, is located relative to the intrusive complexes. And I think the important thing from our perspective as an explorer you know, we very quickly realised where we were looking at the systems, where we were, where these distal uh, indicator minerals were, pathfinder, pathfinder metals were, and how we use that to vector into, back into the core zones of where these, these potential porphyry systems were, were used, or were found. So on to what we call, now call the North Molong Porphyry Project. It's at the very northern end of that, that volcanic belt I was pointing out on the map before. It goes under younger cover, the brown colour there is a younger cover, and uh, it's sort of, it, it's still there, but it's very hard to explore through, in some places, a couple hundred metres of younger sediments. What we, what we found when we, we started looking seriously at the porphyry potential in this North Molong project were, there were a number of known monzonites, these monzonite intrusives outcropping throughout the area. There'd been exploration work carried out by other companies, which probably mostly focused in the, what was called the Kaiser area. And the reason they focused on the Kaiser area because there was outcropping mineralization and some early drilling there proved up a very small resource of, of one gram gold and one gram copper. But most importantly, it was the geochemistry, the alteration vectors that we could see around that. So then we then stood back and said, okay, this is a very large area. How do we go about exploring it? So first thing, detailed aeromagnetics. They, they determine the magnetic units for the monzonitic intrusives, where they are located where they are relative to other features like our surface geological mapping and alteration. We use multi-element uh, lithogeochemistry. So we do this 40, 50 element uh, routine analysis of all materials, using that to help us find where we are in that system I showed before, relative to the potential of the, um, of the porphyry system to produce an economic deposit. And, uh, and Jamie um, Wilkinson is gonna talk later, I think it's the next talk, about the green rock sampling. And we've certainly used that. We use chloride and epidote chemistry for vectoring. You can get a very clear pattern where you are in that envelope to determine if you are in, a, in what we now call a fertile system or just a, a non-fertile system. Electrical geophysics we found are useful, but not definitive. They help you find the targets and we, we target areas, but certainly don't give you a specific target. And we used early drilling. We basically said, okay, we've got a number of targets. Let's go and look at these targets early on and see how they, how they stack up. And we, from that, we branch into very systematic and directed uh, drilling. And from, again, to find that a number of what we call fertile monzonite intrusive complexes. So looking at those in summary, if I start in the Northwest, an area we call Finns Crossing, and this is an area where it looks like there's a very extensive argillic litho cap over the top, so it's hard to see through, hard to see through that material. The, the uh, pyrite, which is disseminated all through that argillic litho cap, obscures the, electro, the electrical geophysics quite dramatically. But luckily, Newmont uh, had done some work here earlier, and we were able to take that work and, and look at and start generating targets. 
In the middle, the coma bella, again, fairly complex area of multiple uh, intrusives. Uh, we've done a bit of work there. We've got one or two reasonably good intersections there, but not something that really hit, said to us, well, this is going to take time. It's going to take time and money to, to come up with the targets, but certainly something we'd come back and look at. We were really drawn to the Kaiser and what became the Kaiser Boda area in the southwest, southeast. Again, because of the outcropping mineralization, the extensive alteration that we could see on the surface, even finding chocopyrite, disseminated chocopyrite and bornite scattered around on the surface through that area. And it's a five kilometer long corridor. Straight away, you could see that and say, well, this has potential to be a very large system. This is just a bit of a, a synthesis of this. And, you know, Greg's already referred to it. Um, uh, Chris has already referred to it. We can very clearly see an intersection here. So we've got what we call the, the Dubbo transverse coral that's sown through here, which are subtle cross-cutting northwest features, which are located right throughout the Macquarie Arc. They seem to have a very important control on the localization of big intrusive centers. Um, not, you know, not themselves a target, but, but, but in the sense of localizing. Where those intersect these northwest, west, sorry, north-south corridors, like we're seeing here, relating to the Nimbathana thrust, there's another one over here, the Macquarie thrust. You seem to see a lot of uh, rotation of, of the rock units, uh, large dilation areas, extensive alteration being driven by these, these dilationary zones that occur. And that started to, to direct us and say, well, this, you know, we're right in this, selecting this Kaiser uh, Boda area as a primary target. The more we looked and the more we understood it, the more we realized that, again, we are looking really at our calic porphyry systems here, not calcalic porphyry systems like you see in, in uh, South America or up in the Western US. These have a lot of similarity to what are called the Golden Triangle area in British Columbia. The type of rocks, the type of alteration, the sequence, uh, the, the driving features, and if you ever ever sort of need to see what's a similar sort of thing to what we think we're looking at in this Boda Kaiser area, look at some of the deposits that have been demonstrated and are being mined in that Golden Triangle. So zeroing in, so we knew from Boda and some drilling, uh, sorry, from Kaiser, some drilling that we'd done there that we had the right kind of alteration, the right kind of mineralization. Where we drilled at Kaiser was probably a bit shallow, and we've got some big broad intercepts. Boda looked similar. Um, we had some shallow intercepts, maybe 100 metres, 200 metres deep, getting 200 metres at 0.2 gold and 0.1 copper. Interesting, but, but not, not earth shattering. So we decided to go in and put a number of core holes, deepish core holes through the whole sequence so we'd understand the geology, understand the mineralisation, which effectively led to what we now describe as the, as the discovery of, of Boda. And you'll get an idea. I mean, this is the first hole, really serious hole drilled into Boda up the top here. Three, 500 metres of just under 0.5 gold and 0.2 copper with higher grade zones throughout it, 100 metres of you know, one gram gold and 0.4 copper. That continued into five, which was, which was similar. Uh, six, we're stepping out on the edge of the system again. And perhaps the most exciting hole was seven, which was right in the central part of, the, of the, what became the Boda system. You can see that hole. A bit over a kilometre of 0.55 gold and 0.25 copper. But most exciting was that high grade zone at the very bottom, 96.8 at 3.97 gold and 1.52 copper. That was probably more encouraging than anything else we drilled in the area because it demonstrated the potential for higher grades, maybe focused higher grades, but definitely uh, higher grades within this large porphyry uh, low grade system. Just a, a section and some core. Uh, that's one of the sections where at this stage when we, when we put the section together, we really didn't have too many holes to, to be able to show. So there's one of those shallow RC holes that I showed you. The first deeper diamond hole coming in underneath, getting the mineralization. The second one coming underneath and repeating that again. And you can see that we've been put around that a 0.2 gram envelope. That's the blue dotted line around through that system. And then a higher grade, well not high grade, the 0.1 copper zone in, uh, inside that area. And really what it was showing is that we were pretty right in our estimation that the top 100 to 200 metres was, was not going to be the primary target. And the primary target was going to be somewhere down here, 200 metres you know, down to where we now drill down to sort of a kilometre depth. Just for interest, there's, the, there's that chalcopyrite cemented breccia and catastrophically altered volcanics in, in KSDD7, the 96 metres. 
um, you probably look at that core and you'll say, gosh, it's all very black. And the reality is it, it is. And that's what makes it quite unusual in New South Wales. We don't have a lot of K feldspar in the alterations. So we don't get the what, technical term pinkification of the rocks. Most of our alteration is biotite. And the biotite alteration is incurring what are, in, you know, what are basically dark rocks anyway, dark blue, green rocks there, andesites and basalts. So it's very hard to distinguish sometimes between unaltered and altered rock. You've really got to look at the chemistry, the mineralization, and then the petrology. So it's a, it's a, it's a scientific endeavor. On just to look at what we've got, and this is defining, I'll focus first on the text rather than the, than the geophysical response. So the boater mineralization that we find in that original, original drill pattern, and I'm talking about greater than 0.2 gram uh, gold equivalent, that horizontal dimensions of about 600 metres, that's in that north, uh, northwest direction down there, about 400 metres wide and true width, and we've tested it down to a depth of about a kilometre. So from that, we said, right, we've got a very si sizable target. It's open in all, virtually in all directions. We did the detailed geophysics, mainly IP, over that strip. At that stage, we thought the main boat of Kaiser strip was confined by that based it around the magnetics and really generate some very strong IP chargeability anomalies, one at Kaiser itself, one at Boda to the south of Boda and then further south again. And that combined with the resistivity that we, we were seeing, the resistivity out here, gave us a very good indication that there's at least a three kilometre long corridor here, which is, shows potential for significant mineralisation. All, all of the things we were doing said- Can you mind up this, in a minute or two, please, mate? Thank you. A very big system, basically, is right now there's a 30,000 30, metre uh, drilling program, RC diamond drilling program underway, which will probably go through to the end of the year and results will be reported as they come out. So just to, just to finish off, that's what our little model now looks like. Uh, it's not unlike most of the other models, it's slightly more focused, there's narrow monzonite intrusives, the potassic core zone, the pyrite, chalcopyrite, pyrite, then going into the outer, outer propolytic zone some phyllic and serocytic zones we're seeing. And then when you go up the fins crossing, you're seeing this larger uh, argillic litho cap. I won't read through all these. Uh, they're just basically a summary of all the key features. But, but we, again, we're very confident that this whole region, the system is 15 kilometre long zone, has potential to host a number of quite reasonable and sizable deposits. And just to finish off, that's what the, the countryside looks like. It's, uh, I have to say, a very pleasant part of the world to, to work in. Um, Sometimes the crops get a bit high, but uh, we're lucky that this year that the drought, which we've had for about three years, has finally broken and there's some greenery around. Uh, that, thanks very much for listening. Awesome, Ian. Thank you so much.